Uh, welcome to everybody out there listening. Uh, so as I said, I'm Dr. Nathaniel Davis. I'm a researcher and lecture, senior lecturer at Victoria University of Wellington. Uh, for people that don't know where that is, uh, this is Australia, pretty easy to find on a map. And uh, we have New Zealand uh, down here and Wellington is based just at the south of the uh, North Island. And I work on anything that involves the interaction of light uh, and energy or energy and light. So it means I work on things like nanocrystals, organic molecules and their interactions together, as well as looking at reabsorption in solar concentrators, which I'll talk about today. I also look at signal fission uh, for solar cells, up conversion for water splitting. Uh, I also make lasers and I'm going to be moving into making LEDs uh, quite soon. Uh, before I start, I'd just like to acknowledge everyone who worked on the research I'm going to present. It's quick, quicker to acknowledge everyone this way. Uh, so everybody at Cambridge and University of New South Wales who worked on the work with me, as well as uh, the people at Victoria who've been working on things more recently. Uh, so what is a luminescent solar concentrator? This is going to be quite a broad but narrow talk. So I'm going to look at a lot of different projects, but all relating to uh, luminescent solar concentrators. So what they are is that they're planar uh, waveguides. So they're a uh, material with a high refractive index and inside you embed them with luminescent materials. And as the light comes in, it's absorbed by the luminescent material and it's emitted. And due to the fact that your plastic or your glass has a higher refractive index than air, your light is totally is trapped and by a total internal reflection and bounces to the edge. So what you end up producing is a piece of plastic or glass that glows out the edges. It's as simple as that. Uh, and the idea being, if you can wrap solar panels around the edge of this plastic, you can reduce the cost of uh, PV, photovoltaic devices, because instead of using a meter squared of silicon, you can use a meter squared of plastic or glass and then a tiny ring of silicon. So it should be a lot cheaper. Um, this sounds amazing. Uh, why don't they exist? Why don't we have solar concentrators across the world? Uh, it's because there's a number of loss mechanisms. And most of these loss mechanisms are actually fixed, uh, but there's one left that sort of feeds back into a lot of them. So if you look at sort of the flow chart of how the device works, a photon is absorbed. It can then either be emitted or not emitted due to its P or QE. So if it undergoes non-radiative decay, you lose the photon. If it's emitted, it can be emitted outside an escape cone. So it hits the top surface at an angle, which means it goes out of the waveguide. But if it's emitted on a waveguide angle, you waveguide your photon and you should be happy. The problem is that photon can actually be reabsorbed. Uh, and so the reabsorbed occurs when the photon, due to the non-zero overlap between absorption and emission, your photon's reabsorbed by another molecule and then it puts you back up the top again. You have to be emitted, you have to be emitted in the right direction and you have to be not reabsorbed to get to the edge. So when you scale up your devices, it's this reabsorption that becomes the problem. Um, and this can be seen quite easily here. All molecules and chromophores have an overlap between the absorption and the emission. And so any overlap here means that there's a chance the absorbed photon, photon will be reabsorbed. And this increases with size. So a tiny little one by one centimeter device works perfectly. Uh, but as you get to 10 centimeters or a meter squared, this reabsorption really comes to play. Um, so what I'm going to be talking about today is just five different ways that we've looked at to reduce reabsorption, really quite simple chemistry ways and sort of simplifying at each step. Um, so what we want to do is we want to recreate nature. Um, so biomimicry is a great idea to start on research because biology's had millions and millions of years to evolve into very efficient and very specific structures for chromophores. And so this is a bacteria phycobilosome. It has different proteins for the blue, the green and red absorbing parts of the visible spectrum. And they're all connected uh, by energy transfer mechanisms. In this case, it's forced a residence energy transfer. And so the blue proteins absorb lots of light, the green proteins absorb lots of light, and they all funnel it into this red center. And then that's emitted into the phycloid membrane uh, to basically enable photosynthesis. But what, the, what nature's done here is uh, it's separated its absorption and its emission events. And so now you can do a dummy uh, model system of two molecules. You have an absorbing molecule and an emissive molecule. You make sure the emissive molecule is redshifted. And then all you do is you lower the concentration of that emissive molecule. So in a one-to-one -one state, two molecules, you see it emits here, 
but it also absorbs here. But as we decrease our second molecule, our acceptor, you can see that the overlap decreases. And now we have 100 molecules absorbing light, one molecule emitting light, so the reabsorption is very small. Um, you could do this by trying to synthesize specific molecules, um, but it's always hard to work out how the wave functions and the orbitals overlap to produce uh, the energy levels and the overlap between the absorption and reabsorption. So it's better to separate them and just do it as a two module component system. Um, so the first thing, uh, number one of these ideas is what if we try and recreate this bacteriophycobilisome as accurately as possible, uh, but also still simply because we're, we're not going to invent anything this uh, excessive, but we have a small Bodipi center and that's surrounded by these fluorine arms. And these fluorine arms are oligomers, so this N means that there could be multiple numbers, so two, three, or four. So you can imagine this fluorine molecule extending to be quite large. To look like this, the fluorines absorb blue light, they transfer the energy to the Bodipi center, which emits, uh, in this case, orange light. And so we can make these molecules. We made a two, a three, and a four, which just means two Bodipis, three Bodipis, or four Bodipis in each arm. As you can see, as we normalize them, uh, the peak uh, fluorine absorbance, we see this decrease in our Bodipi component because we're uh, decreasing the relative concentration of the Bodipis to the fluorine. Uh, it would have been nice if uh, organic molecules behaved, but the problem is they all have different POQEs. So this means that they absorb uh, POQEs, the number of photons absorbed to the number of photons emitted. Uh, and so the F3B, the one with three fluorines, emits light uh, the most. But it's okay because we can still study that and learn from this molecule. So we can measure the efficiency. At the moment, our EQE is number of photons that hit the top surface versus the number of photons coming out the side. And we see that there's only efficiencies around 2%. Um, we are going to be simulating a lot of the results uh, as well. We're going to measure and simulate in this part just to show how strong simulations can be for luminous and solar concentrators. Um, and it just takes data like absorption coefficients, uh, refractive index, uh, POQEs, emission profiles, and it builds up this statistically uh, quite accurate uh, models of our systems. Um, if we look at the IQE, we see that our efficiency increases. So IQE is a number of absorbed photons. And so this allows us to take account that we're not absorbing any of the IR photons. And there's a big gap in the sort of 400 to 500 region here. So at the moment, our simulated and our measured devices are looking quite similar. We can go on and measure lots of different things. So this is a basically a 2D scan of the EQE. So we take our solar concentrator and we excite it at different X, Y coordinates and we see how much light comes out. And as you'd expect, the deeper you go into the device, the less light coming out because you're having more reabsorption. So we have our two is okay. Our three is better, but that's because it has the highest POQE and our four is better than our two, even though it has sort of a lower POQE. Um, and our experimental error between our simulated and measured is about 5%. So we're getting quite accurate there. We can also look at what happens to uh, the emission spectra due to reabsorption. So this experiment has a solar concentrator with a photo diode on the side or a spectrometer on the side, and we excite deeper and deeper into the device to simulate uh, this increase in path length. And so as expected, we see this decrease in uh, intensity for all devices and also a redshift. And that's because the higher energy photons, the blue end of this spectrum is more likely to be reabsorbed. And our simulations predict this quite nicely. Uh, finally, we just have a wavelength dependent EQE. So this is, uh, shows our Bodipi region and our increasing fluorine contributions if when we go from two to three to four fluorines. Uh, so now we know that the simulations can predict. So on here, uh, just to show the dotted lines, uh, dotted points are simulated and the curve is, uh, mo is actually experimental. So now we know that the data agrees very nicely with uh, simulated data. We can actually simulate devices instead of making them. So the first thing we realize is the devices I showed previously up here uh, were made at the wrong concentration, so to speak. Uh, if we made them at this higher concentration, we would have had increased efficiencies. The problem was we didn't have enough of the molecule because it was quite hard to synthesize. Uh, this F0 
F700 is just a flux measurement. Uh, and it basically is a measurement of how much light would hit your solar panel in the sun compared to how much light hits it on the side of our concentrator. So if you're not above one, then it means your concentrator is not actually concentrating light. So none of our devices are actually uh, concentrators, but we see that if we increase the geometric ratio, which is the size of our device, the devices I made uh, here were 10 by 10 centimeters, which is quite big for a lab scale device. But we see that if we went up to a meter by a meter, which is a geometric ratio of 80, uh, we'd actually start getting values around sort of 5%. So it means, well, five times, it means we're actually concentrating light five times. Uh, the more interesting thing to do is sort of imagine what sort of molecules we could make. We could make molecules that had eight fluorines to increase the absorption here. We could fill in that green gap we had by a green absorbing molecule. And we could also go deeper into the red with a deep red absorber. So this is an, a two F with eight ODPs and then a green center and then the oh, eight fluorines by dipping in then this deep red molecule. So we put all this data into the simulations and we see that these efficiencies would have been close to 8% or say 13% the best case. And all of these would have shown flux gains uh, above one. So all of these would have been theoretically concentrators instead of, I don't wanna call them diffusers because it makes it sound a bit sad for the research, but that's what the other ones were. Um, and then we can see that if we did a large geometric ratio of these devices, we can start getting up to values of say 10 times solar intensity, depending on where we draw our threshold for how much light we need. Because of course, these molecules are still ignoring the infrared. So we put our thresholds at say 700 or 900 to ignore the other light. Um, if you want to read more on that, you can see this paper. But what we realize in this is making organic molecules is hard, it's complex, and sometimes the biggest problem was this P or QE value, which we couldn't even change. It just meant that the F3B was always going to be better. Um, so we're going to avoid that. What could we do instead? So we want to make a, a system that's on average like that phycobilosome. It has all the chromophores in the right place and they do energy transfer. The interesting thing about energy transfer is they don't have to be in the right place. They just have to be within the right distance. So what we designed was a polymer kind of like a charm bracelet in that we hang these chromophores off the edge. And as long as the green chromophores are within a suitable distance from the red chromophores, this would actually act like a phycobilosome. So we synthesize these monomers. We wanted them to have something that solubilizes the group, a large chromophore center that was fit for purpose and this monomer group. So we made two, we made this sort of orangey yellow one based off perylene diamide, uh, perylene orange, a common chromophore. And we made this second one, this perylene red. And these phenyl groups actually act to give a torsion on the pi system and redshift this chromophore. But it's the same. It has a monomer end, a solubilizing end, and a big chromophore center. So here are our two molecules. We have this good overlap between the emission and the absorption of our sensitizer and our acceptor which means they'll be a good fret pair. And now all we have to do is make them into polymers. So we put them into polymers. Uh, we could either make a sensitizer or an acceptor polymer, or we can make this copolymer. And we can vary the ratio of our acceptors to our sensitizers very easily by just putting different amounts into the reaction. And we also have this third component, which we call a spacer unit. Uh, this is, in this case, uh, it's a tert butylacrylate. Uh, tert butylacrylate, so it's, it's inert, it doesn't absorb light, it doesn't emit light, but it's a spacer group. So we can control the spacing of our monomers along this polymer chain. Um, sadly, when we did this, we didn't actually see interpolymer transfer along a single chain. It was to do the different lengths of our chains. And we probably could have gone a bit deeper uh, to find out about this, but we actually found the result we're looking for when we made a film of this polymer. So we make a long film and we saw this energy transfer systems. Uh, and the easiest way to show this was this graph here. So this is five to one. So this is five of the, the sensitizer, the orange one, and one of the red ones. See, it's emitting all out of the red. The absorbance looks okay. When we go to 10 to one, we decrease that overlap. As simple as that, we can change a new molecular system, but it's adding half as less amount of the red. Uh, 
we went on to publish this. And again, if you want to read up on that, uh, it's shown here. But the problem is we're still synthesizing molecules. The, the synthesis for these things wasn't really uh, trivial and quite a lot of work. And so we want to make that easier. So instead of doing polymers, we thought, how about we attach it to a scaffold? Uh, and in this case, the scaffold is a silicon dioxide nanoparticle. We aminate the surface and attach our monomers as carboxylic acids. And so in this case, we can then get energy transfer from say a blue molecule to a red molecule. And still we're going for that idea that on average, we're a phycobilosome where this big, really intensely structured, highly advanced natural synthesis kind of idea, but we're trying to simplify that. So what we do is we attach some dyes to a glass ball in this case. Um, and we have three different dyes. We had a blue, an orange dye, and a red dye. And as you can see, these molecules are what we've shown before. Um, and we can make all these different systems, a blue orange, a blue red, and uh, orange red. The problem was with the orange red system was that the orange ones actually form this deep red eczema state shown here in the emission, this orange dotted line, which is actually redder than our red molecule. Um, and so we couldn't do energy transfer from the red eczema to the slightly bluer red molecule. So this one didn't work, but these two, blue to orange and blue to red, worked quite nicely. Um, and although this talk's quite short, I won't go too much into the photophysics or the transverse spectroscopy we did. But what we see is we see that we can excite the blue molecule, the population increases, it decreases and transfers its energy to the orange molecule, which is what we wanted to show. Um, so again, if you want to read up on that, you can, but we found that that was slightly too hard because the attachment along here, in this case, formed this exomeric state, which is too red, and then we couldn't control that. Um, and the way they lied on the surface was a bit hard. So we thought, how about we just put them into the same area as close as possible? And again, this is always hard because as we know, dyes aggregate, they form H and J aggregates and they decrease their emission and they can't emit when they're in this aggregate form. But these eczemas they form have high mobility. So as long as the lowest energy chromophore isn't aggregated, it should be able to emit. So what we do is we mix some blue, some green and some red dye together, but we decrease the concentration of the red dye so that all the energy ends up in single red dye units. Um, and it's as simple as that. What we do is we take a blue dye, a green dye, and a red dye, mix them together. The red and green dyes have very high POQEs. The blue only has 10%, but it doesn't matter because we're going to get all the emission out of the red dye anyway. We just have to make sure that every excitation ends up in a red one. You can see they all glow quite nicely and they glow in a polymer film. So we calculate the force of uh, radius and the force of radiance is uh, the distance between two chromophores that are doing force of resonance energy transfer that leads to a transfer of excitation 50% of the time. So as long as you're shorter than that distance, you should be doing efficient energy transfer. And so we calculate the distance to be around four to sort of nine nanometers. And so it means that if all our molecules are within four nanometers together, they should be able to do efficient energy transfer. So we put that on a grid, we work out the concentration that would be in a PMMA matrix, and we make samples like that. Uh, and as you can see in the solution, before we make them into films, they glow white because the green, the red, and the blue are all glowing. But as they shrink down into this high density polymer matrix, they start glowing red because all the energy transfer is happening. And then now you have a bit of fun. You put them on glass slides. You see these glow nicely. You carve them off of a razor, these thick polymer film things. They glow amazingly. You grind them up in liquid nitrogen and get really, really small bits of polymer all shattered up. And then you end up with this really fine film like powder that just glows. And the powder is like our molecular complex of all the different things in there. And you do some 2D excitation emission scans on it. So this is where we excite at every wavelength and we measure at every wavelength. And we see that all the light ends up out of our red chromophore. So it doesn't matter where you hit this molecule, or by molecule, I mean this powder, it emits in the red light, uh, the red region. And then you can redisperse this into, a, into an LSC. Uh, there is a bit of problem because there is quite a large difference between sizes, quite a small particle here and a large particle. And as you can see, some of the larger ones have indeed 
uh, are quite visible. But if you grind these up in a cryo ball mill, they get a lot smaller and you can make really nice LSCs where the actual molecular unit is another pre-made polymer uh, unit. And then all you do is you change the degree of your red, green, and blue. So one to one to one, 20, 20 to one, 100 to 100 to one, and so on. You can see you can decrease this overlap and reabsorption by just chucking things into a jar and, and spinning it up instead of doing all this hard synthesis we're doing before. Um, so if you wanted to read about uh, that, that's this paper. But there's slightly more because, again, that's still a lot of work just to get a simple reduction and reabsorption. Uh, so we thought about what if we can make a film. So you can always reduce reabsorption in a solar concentrator by having a transparent waveguide with a thin film on top of it. Um, and then you only get the reabsorption between the active layer. But what if this active layer itself had voids where there wasn't dye? There wasn't anything absorbing the light. So we're trying to make these self-assembled voids to decrease reabsorption. Again, we're using our two chromophores. It's a good uh, continuation of all the stories. This is like all the other sensitizers we've had. It just has two ends, makes it more soluble. Same with this perylene red. It's, this is also the green molecule we showed before. So all the same molecules. Um, you can then go and make films. You can make a PMMA, which is our normal polymer. You can use this new copolymer, which has a bit of styrene and a bit of these carboxylic acid groups, it was meant to be this sort of polar, non-polar thing. And then you can make one-to-one -one mixtures. And then you just mix them together with different amounts of perylene red and perylene orange and blade coat them across your glass. Uh, we measure these inside of integrating sphere, which means we can calculate how much light is present, put the device in, see how much light is emitted. And then if we tape the edges, we can see how much light was being emitted out the sides to do all our calculations. Uh, the first thing to see is if we look under an optical microscope at 40 times magnification, we see that the PMMA and the copolymer look quite uniform. There is a bit of uh, roughness to the copolymer and that's because it's quite hard to dissolve it uh, in the standard solvents we were using. Uh, but the one-to-one -one mixture does have this textured sort of look to it and a bit more interesting. Uh, this is seen when we go to uh, SEM. If we zoom in on these films, we see that the PMA and the copolymer look very similar. Smoothness, a bit rough there due to different solubility, but the copolymer has these large voids within it. Uh, they're a couple of micron, or say one or so, or half a micron in size. And this permeates throughout the whole device, not just on the surface layer. Whereas the other two devices are pretty flat and uniform. And so what we calculated is the first thing to note is that our mixed device had the highest PLQE. It was emitting the most light. This isn't necessarily out the edges or out the top, but it's emitting the most light. When we look at the edge efficiency, we see that it's quite low, which is bad. We wanted a lot of light out of the edge. Um, and this is because it turns out if you put a bunch of optically sized, so half micron size, voids within a polymer matrix, you're going to make it scatter. So now it's not a uniform waveguide, it's scattering light at the top. But the good thing to see is our reabsorption events, the number of reabsorption events has actually been halved. And so you can do everything we we're trying to do before just by playing around uh, with voids in the device. And so in the future, we'd want to backfill these maybe with some sort of high refractive index polymer to get rid of the scattering effects while maintaining the reduced reabsorption effects. Um, again, there's this been published if you want to read more up on it. Uh, but the main summary is that we can take something as complicated as nature and we can try at varying levels of synthetic complexity or complexity to recreate this. But as we slowly shrink it down to something that'd be more commercial use, uh, we find that you can make gains on this reabsorption. But at some stage, you start making gains in the wrong direction and it's actually losses for efficiency, even though you've reduced reabsorption. And um, what I'm working on now is very much more like a combined uh, hybrid chromophore that's a nanocrystal attached to a dye where I can do reabsorption or energy transfer and decrease reabsorption as a single chromophore unit which is a self-assembly version of this 
uh, will be really efficient compared to self-assembling uh, the actual film structure. Uh, so thank you everyone for listening. Uh, if you want to contact me, my email is here. You just Google Nathaniel Davis. I'm sure I'll come up, uh, maybe put science in case. I think there's an ambassador who also has my same name. Uh, but thank you very much for listening. And it was an honor to be able to talk to you guys from New Zealand.